thought is the only thing over which you have absolute control, yet unless you are the proverbial exception, which is about one out of every ten thousand, you permit other people to enter the sacred mansion of your mind, and there deposit through suggestion their troubles and woes, adversities and falsehoods, just as though you did not have the power to close the door and keep them out. You have within your control the power to select the material that constitutes the dominating thoughts of your mind. And just as surely as you are reading these lines, those thoughts which dominate your mind will bring you success or failure according to their nature. The fact that thought is the only thing over which you have absolute control is within itself of most profound significance, as it strongly suggests that thought is your nearest approach to divinity on this earthly plane. This fact also carries another highly impressive suggestion, namely, that thought is your most important tool, the one with which you may shape your worldly destiny according to your own liking. Surely divine providence did not make thought the sole power over which you have absolute control without associating with that power potentialities which, if understood and developed, would stagger the imagination. Self-control is solely a matter of thought control. Please read the foregoing sentence aloud, read it thoughtfully, and meditate over it before reading further, because it is without doubt the most important single sentence of this entire course. You are studying this course, presumably because you are earnestly seeking truth and understanding sufficient to enable you to attain some high station in life. You are searching for the magic key that will unlock the door to the source of power, and yet you have the key in your own hands and you may make use of it the moment you learn to control your thoughts. Place in your mind, through the principle of auto-suggestion, the positive constructive thoughts which harmonize with your definite chief aim in life, and that mind will transform those thoughts into physical reality and hand them back to you as a finished product. This is thought control. When you deliberately choose the thoughts which dominate your mind and firmly refuse admittance to outside suggestion, you are exercising self-control in its highest and most efficient form. Man is the only living animal that can do this. How many millions of years nature has required in which to produce this animal, no one knows. But every intelligent student of psychology knows that the dominating thoughts determine the actions and the nature of the animal. The process through which one may think accurately is a subject that has been reserved for Lesson 11 of this course. The point we wish clearly to establish in this lesson is that thought, whether accurate or inaccurate, is the most highly organized functioning power of your mind, and that you are but the sum total of your dominating or most prominent thoughts. If you would be a master salesman, whether of goods and wares or of personal services, you must exercise sufficient self-control to shut out all adverse arguments and suggestions. Most salesmen have so little self-control that they hear the prospective purchaser say no even before he says it. Not a few salesmen hear this fatal word no even before they come into the presence of their prospective purchaser. They have so little self-control that they actually suggest to themselves that their prospective purchaser will say no when asked to purchase their wares. How different is the man of self-control? He not only suggests to himself that his prospective purchaser will say yes, but if the desired yes is not forthcoming, he stays on the job until he breaks down the opposition and forces a yes. If his prospective purchaser says no, he does not hear it. If his prospective purchaser says no, a second and a third and a fourth time, he does not hear it, for he is a man of self-control and he permits no suggestions to reach his mind except those which he desires to influence him. The master salesman, whether he be engaged in selling merchandise or personal services or sermons or public addresses, understands how to control his own thoughts. Instead of being a person who accepts with meek submission the suggestions of others, he is a person who persuades others to accept his suggestions. By controlling himself and by placing only positive thoughts in his own mind, he thereby becomes a dominating personality, a master salesman. This, too, is self-control. A master salesman is one who takes the offensive and never the defensive side of an argument, if argument arises. 
Please read the foregoing sentence again. If you are a master salesman, you know that it is necessary for you to keep your prospective purchaser on the defensive. And you also know that it will be fatal to your sale if you permit him to place you on the defensive and keep you there. You may, and of course you will at times, be placed in a position in which you will have to assume the defensive side of the conversation for a time. But it is your business to exercise such perfect poise and self-control that you will change places with your prospective purchaser without his noticing that you have done so, by placing him back on the defensive. This requires the most consummate skill and self-control. Most salesmen sweep this vital point aside by becoming angry and trying to scare the prospective purchaser into submission, but the master salesman remains calm and serene, and usually comes out the winner. The word salesman has reference to all people who try to persuade or convince others by logical argument or appeal to self-interest. We are all salesmen, or at least we should be, no matter what form of service we are rendering or what sort of goods we are offering. The ability to negotiate with other people without friction and argument is the outstanding quality of all successful people. Observe those nearest to you and notice how few there are who understand this art of tactful negotiation. Observe also how successful are the few who understand this art, despite the fact that they may have less education than those with whom they negotiate. It is a knack that can be cultivated. The art of successful negotiation grows out of patient and painstaking self-control. Notice how easily the successful salesman exercises self-control when he is handling a customer who is impatient. In his heart such a salesman may be boiling over, but you will see no evidence of it in his face or manner or words. He has acquired the art of tactful negotiation. A single frown of disapproval or a single word denoting impatience will often spoil a sale, and no one knows this better than the successful salesman. He makes it his business to control his feelings, and as a reward he sets his own salary mark and chooses his own position. To watch a person who has acquired the art of successful negotiation is a liberal education within itself. Watch the public speaker who has acquired this art. Notice the firmness of his step as he mounts the platform. Observe the firmness of his voice as he begins to speak. Study the expression on his face as he sweeps his audience with the mastery of his argument. He has learned how to negotiate without friction. Watch the physician who has acquired this art as he walks into the sick room and greets his patient with a smile. His bearing, the tone of his voice, the look of assurance on his face all mark him as one who has acquired the art of successful negotiation and the patient begins to feel better the moment he enters the sick room. Watch the foreman of the works who has acquired this art, and observe how his very presence spurs his men to greater effort, and inspires them with confidence and enthusiasm. Watch the lawyer who has acquired this art, and observe how he commands the respect and attention of the court, the jury, and his fellow practitioners. There is something about the tone of his voice, the posture of his body, and the expression on his face which causes his opponent to suffer by comparison. He not only knows his case, but he convinces the court and the jury that he knows, and as his reward, he wins his cases and claims big retaining fees. And all of this is predicated upon self-control. And self-control is the result of thought control. Deliberately place in your own mind the sort of thoughts that you desire there, and keep out of your mind those thoughts which others place there through suggestion, and you will become a person of self-control. This privilege of stimulating your mind with suggestions and thoughts of your own choosing is your prerogative power that divine providence gave you, and if you will exercise this holy right there is nothing within the bounds of reason that you cannot attain. Losing your temper, and with it your case, or your argument, or your sale, marks you as one who has not yet familiarized himself with the fundamentals upon which self-control is based, and the chief one of these fundamentals is the privilege of choosing the thoughts that dominate the mind. A student in one of my classes once asked how one went about controlling one's thoughts when in a state of intense anger, and I replied, in exactly the same way that you would change your manner and the tone of your voice if you were in a heated argument with a member of your family and heard the doorbell ring, warning you that company was about to visit you. 
you would control yourself because you would desire to do so. If you have ever been in a similar predicament, where you found it necessary to cover up your real feelings and change the expression on your face quickly, you know how easily it can be done, and you also know that it can be done because one wants to do it. Back of all achievement, back of all self-control, back of all thought control, is that magic something called desire. It is no misstatement of fact to say that you are limited only by the depth of your desires. When your desires are strong enough, you will appear to possess superhuman powers to achieve. No one has ever explained this strange phenomenon of the mind, and perhaps no one ever will explain it. But if you doubt that it exists, you have but to experiment and be convinced. If you were in a building that was on fire and all the doors and windows were locked, the chances are that you would develop sufficient strength with which to break down the average door because of your intense desire to free yourself. If you desire to acquire the art of successful negotiation, as you undoubtedly will when you understand its significance in relation to your achievement of your definite chief aim, you will do so, providing your desire is intense enough. Napoleon desired to become emperor of France and did rule. Lincoln desired to free the slaves, and he accomplished it. The French desired that they shall not pass at the beginning of the World War, and they didn't pass. Edison desired to produce light with electricity, and he produced it, although he was many years in doing so. Roosevelt desired to unite the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans through the Panama Canal, and he did it. Demosthenes desired to become a great public speaker, and despite the handicap of serious impediment of speech, he transformed his desire into reality. Helen Keller desired to speak, and despite the fact that she was deaf, dumb, and blind, she now speaks. John H. Patterson desired to dominate in the production of cash registers, and he did it. Marshall Field desired to be the leading merchant of his time, and he did. Shakespeare desired to become a great playwright, and despite the fact that he was only a poor itinerant actor, he made his desire come true. Billy Sunday desired to quit playing baseball and become a master preacher, and he did. James J. Hill desired to become an empire builder, and despite the fact that he was only a poor telegraph operator, he transformed that desire into reality. Don't say it can't be done, or that you are different from these and thousands of others who have achieved noteworthy success in every worthy calling. If you are different, it is only in this respect. They desired the object of their achievement with more depth and intensity than you desire yours.' 